Okay, so now we'll get in this presentation, we'll get beyond some of the some of the background theory and get more into um, some of the formulas, basic formulas and concepts that we use in risk models when we're calculating um, and combining probabilities to, to construct our risk estimate. So we'll cover a couple things here. There's a there's lots and lots of different techniques and rules and, and methods and probability. We'll just cover a handful of the most common ones that you'll see come up in, uh, in risk analysis and risk calculations and try to give you some examples as we go along of um, how and when and where and why some of these rules um, are used in different scenarios. Uh, and then hopefully you'll come out of this being able to apply some of these rules in practice. So here's kind of the, the laundry list of some of the rules. Some of these are rules that we use um, for some of our risk calculations, that's kind of the, maybe the top half of the list, so subtraction, multiplication, addition, total probability to Morgan's Law. Um, unimodal bounds we don't use a lot, so we're probably not going to touch on that. And then the bottom three there are really things that, well, things that we, um, we don't often use explicitly, but they're things to have in mind um, and understand um, what they are and how they work because they are things that um, support some of the things we do. So like, for example, um, law, law of large numbers um, is something that's really uh, fundamental to supporting how Monte Carlo works. Uh, Bayes' theorem can be really helpful, though we, we rarely use it in practice, um, but having it in the back of your mind is good to help um, understand when you're um, doing expert judgment on probabilities, um, how that would play out formally um, in terms of actually using Bayes' theorem. All right, so let's just jump into some of these rules. And again, these you'll see some overlap with some of the set theory things we covered yesterday. Um, some of these rules kind of evolve out of that. Uh, so rule subtraction. So rule subtraction is where we calculate the probability for the complement of an event. So remember, um, we have an event A occurs. The complement is event A does not occur. If we know the probability of A, we can estimate the probability of its complement by just taking one minus that probability. Um, the reason we do this is because it greatly simplifies calculations. So imagine a scenario, you know, where you have um, uh, different failure modes and you're trying to figure out all the different ways the thing could fail or not fail. Right, and you're having to work through all those combinations you know, that we talked about yesterday, um, this can be just kind of a shortcut to, um, to simplify things so you don't have to have to sort through all those details. If you know the probability of A, then you can easily calculate the probability of not A um, using this formula. And uh, later on, we'll, when I talk about um, uh, long-term risk probability calculations. Um, I'll maybe circle back to this and, and cover a specific example of, of where this simplifies things. Second one is rule of multiplication. So um, the idea here is that when you're doing intersections, intersection probabilities are calculated through multiplication. So the nice thing about risk analysis is the calculations are like, it's almost all adding and, uh, adding and multiplying. Um, so the math is pretty pretty simple um, for the most part. Uh, so if you're doing intersection of events, um, again, commonly in event trees when you're trying to uh, get, say, a total probability of failure for all, uh, for the intersection of all the events um, that describe a failure mode, it's going to be a straight multiplication of those probabilities. And again, you'll note here in the formula, right, that we have this written as a conditional probability, right? So the probability of A intersection means and, right? Probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred. And uh, so graphically, the example here is, you know, what's the what's the probability that we get with spillway flow and erosion of the spillway, right? So if we can estimate the probability of spillway flow, 
and then we can estimate the probability of erosion given that spillway flow has occurred. Right? We can. It's easier to estimate those two probabilities separately. And then if we want to get the intersection, which well, what we really care about is the probability of both occurring. Right? We can then just multiply those individual probabilities. So again, this is just common practice in risk analysis that it's almost always easier to decompose things into discrete events that are easy to define and easier to estimate their probabilities. And then we combine them with rules like this. Next one is rule of addition. Rule of addition goes with union. So remember union, uh, think of union as or. So in this example, we have two events, A and B. So the union means either A occurs, B occurs, or possibly both occur. So this might be when you're estimating total probability of failure and you have two failure modes. Right, we want to. We want to. Um, we want the union. Right, it could be A or B or both. So again, another common way to combine probabilities uh, and risk. So um, the probability of union for two events can be obtained by just summing their marginal probabilities. So P of A, P of A plus P of B. And then if you look at this graphically here, right, if you were to add the area of this circle P of A plus P of B, this overlapping area here. Uh, gets counted twice when you sum those together, right? So we have to then correct for that by backing out or subtracting out um, the intersection, right? Because it got counted twice when we summed the two marginal probabilities. And again, you'll see different variations of this formula, but this is kind of the textbook version um, for doing um, the union for two events. Uh, if the two events are mutually exclusive, then there should be no overlap. They don't intersect. So P of A times P of B should be zero. So if they are mutually exclusive, this third term here drops out and it rolls back to the uh, formula that we had in the third axiom of probability where you can just add the two marginal probabilities to get the, uh, the union. That comes into play in event tree analysis. So in event trees, um, event trees, um, and risk calculations in general, when you when you describe um, all the pathways and all the events, um, you end up with a set of um, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive events. You remember that from yesterday. Mutually exclusive means there's only one pathway that can happen in a given event, and collectively exhaustive means we've covered all the possible pathways. So when we're estimating like total risk estimates from an event tree, and you're thinking of um, if you're from, and sorry if you're not familiar with event trees, we'll, we'll cover that a tiny bit later in the course. But um, if you've ever seen an event tree, um, when we're trying to get like a, a total risk estimate, we sum um, essentially vertically, right, from top to bottom, we can sum probabilities and risk uh, values. And the reason we can do that is because um, those branches and pathways are both mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, assuming we've built our event tree correctly. So this formula, we would have the, the second bullet would apply, right, where we have mutually exclusive um, branches in our event tree, and we, we want the probability of any of those branches happening, which would be our estimate of the total, let's say the total risk estimate. We can just sum them up. Uh, question in the chat here, is PA times PB an intersection? Yes, yes. So, um, so you sum the marginals, and then because the intersection gets counted twice, you have to subtract out the intersection. So PA times PB is an intersection of A and B. Next one is the rule of total probability. Um, so if you've, ever, if you've ever done any risk modeling or risk calculations, um, this is really commonly used. And again, it, it, again a lot of these um, rules are allow us to um, decompose our risk estimate into smaller pieces and then estimate each piece and then combine them to get the, the total risk estimate, let's say. So this allows us to break up uh, our probability calculations into distinct parts. So one of the things um, as you do risk analysis you'll see people talk about is when we have, let's say, a flood hazard curve, so maybe a stage frequency curve for a, for a um, reservoir. Um, we will break up that speed stage frequency curve into loading increments, right? So we will break it up into smaller pieces. And for each piece, we will have kind of a representative stage and a, and a probability for that piece. Um, 
if you tie that back to the concept of the risk equation being an integral, right, that's essentially an application of like the rectangle rule or the trapezoidal rule for numerical integration. So you basically split the flood hazard curve into discrete pieces, discrete parts. You can then estimate um, probabilities for each part. So you could say, well, what if I have, a, you know, what if I break it into three, three parts, a small flood, a medium flood, and a large flood? So I have, you know, a small flood has some probability of occurring, a medium flood has some probability of occurring, and a large flood has some probability of occurring. And then let's say I have a failure mode that depends on the magnitude of the flood, right? So probability of failure given a small flood might be low, probability of failure given a medium flood might be moderate, and probability of failure given a large flood might be, might be high, right? So you can think of this picture this way, right, where think of like um, um, B, uh, being the flood loading and us breaking it up into discrete parts and then A being a failure mode, right? So what's the probability of failure given some discrete magnitude of flood event? And so this is how risk models work and how risk calculations work. And if we want the total probability of A, which is failure, right, we get that from the intersection of A and B. and which is this second term in the equation here, this, this first term here right of the equal sign. And then we can decompose that further by breaking up um, B into smaller, smaller bite-sized pieces and, uh, and calculate our risk estimate this way. Um, so this is, this is basically how most risk models um, work and are, are set up to use this, this rule of total probability. And if, if we do that, if we break it up correctly following this rule, then when we calculate each part separately and add them up, uh, we will get the correct uh, total probability for our system. Next one is De Morgan's Law. So De Morgan's Law is um, the, the formal version of Morgan's Law is this Venn diagram here on the left-hand side of the picture. So Morgan's Law tells us, sorry, De Morgan's Law tells us that the union of um, two events, A and B, is equal to one minus um, the intersection of the complement, right? So it's easier to calculate this intersection of complements than it is to calculate this union, um, especially when you have more than two or three um, events. So we use this as kind of a shortcut to, you know, what we really want is the union, but we use this one minus the intersection of the complements as the shortcut to get the union. So you can think of it in three steps. Um, this calculation combines actually two rules. It uses De Morgan's law combined with the rule of subtraction. And again, this is one of the ways we can calculate a, um, a total probability, say, of uh, failure or not non-failure, which, whichever direction we, we want to go. So in this example, um, the way we can kind of derive how the calculation works is we start with the probability of not failing equaling uh, 1 minus um, the probability of failure. The second step here is we can calculate the total probability of not failing as the intersection, so product, so this, this symbol here mathematically means product, right? So the total probability of not failing is um, one minus the probability of failure, which is probability of not failing for, say, each failure mode. Uh, we do that calculation for every failure mode, multiply those all together. That gives us the total probability of, of non-failure. And then if we want the total probability of failure, we can take one minus that, that value, right? So instead of doing, for a union, instead of doing P of A plus P of B and then dealing with all the intersections, right? Remember the formula a few slides ago, we had to subtract out the intersection. When you have three or more events, you end up with lots of intersections, and this A union B ends up with lots and lots of terms in it. Um, you can, again, simplify the calculation to get a total probability of failure by just doing it this way, and you don't have to worry about um, correctly accounting for all of the um, intersection probabilities in the union calculation. So again, just a shortcut. Um, and I think on the, I think it's on the next slide, I think we'll see a better example of, of a specific application where you can use this shortcut. Uh, 
So long-term exceedance probability, this is a term the core uses. It's in some of our planning guidance um, as one of the metrics we, we are asked to report for planning studies. So again, it's an application of De Morgan's Law and the Rule of Subtraction. Um, it basically answers the question, uh, answers a question like if you know, there's an annual probability of flooding equal to some value P. What is the probability that we would see flooding over some period of time, N years? The classic example of this is uh, FEMA has a classic uh, example where they ask the question, if you were to purchase a house that was within the 100-year floodplain, such that your annual probability of flooding was 1 in 100 or 0 0.01, what is the probability that your house will be flooded um, at some point over the course of a 30-year mortgage. So N equals 30. So if you plug that in the formula, if you put 0.01 for P and 30 for N, you'll get about 26% or about one in four. Um, and again, you see, you'll see here, this is a really simple calculation and, and what makes it, uh, the other way to do this, if you were to calculate this just as a union, you'd be asking yourself the question, well, what are all the different ways that I could be flooded, right? Well, I could be flooded once, I could be flooded twice, I could be flooded three times, four times, 10 times, could, could be flooded every year, at least in theory, right? And then on top of that, it's, well, in what year would I be flooded, right? So if I, you know, if I'm gonna get flooded twice, well, that could be in year one, one in year one and year two, it could be year one and year 10, year three and year seven, and so, you know, when you think back yesterday with combinations, if you wanted to actually explicitly estimate the probability of union, right, what are all the ways I could be flooded and how do I calculate the probability of getting flooded? Um, uh, you're literally in the millions of combinations. And so the calculation becomes um, incredibly tedious. Uh, whereas if you do it um, this way, um, if you do it this way, it's a really simple formula that you can plug in. There was a, there was a question in the chat here about probability of being flooding. So one, one subtle thing we often, uh, we often leave out and it's left out here is technically this, this number we're calculating is the probability of being flooded uh, at least once. So it's one or more times. So oftentimes when, you'll, when you see problem statements like this, uh, oftentimes we forget and leave out the at least once part, but that is a important piece to this, right? The thing we're calculating is um, what's the chance of your house not being flooded exactly once, but being flooded, right? Which means one or more times. Um, now, of course, you know, if you're in a hundred year floodplain, the odds of getting flooded multiple times are pretty low. Um, but it's still possible, right? So every year you have a, a one in a hundred chance of getting flooded for a period of 30 years, right? And if each year is independent, you know, you could be flooded any number of years over that, over that 30 year period. All right, next thing we'll talk about here is the central limit theorem. So central limit theorem is just kind of one of those um, useful things to know in risk analysis. Um, it really tells us two, two general things. Um, one is that um, when you're summing probability distributions, as we might do in a risk analysis um, or in a Monte Carlo analysis, um, they will always trend towards a normal distribution. And in, in the limit, that's why it's called the central limit theorem, in the limit as the number of distributions gets really large, it will exactly become a normal distribution. Um, so a really simple example here where we have, and we'll talk about distributions later on, but um, here's a uniform, two uniform distributions that have uh, values between zero and one for some random variable, and the probability of, of a particular value is the same for any value of x between zero and one. Um, it's called a uniform distribution. If you were to put these in a Monte Carlo analysis and add them together, so draw ran random samples from each distribution and add them together, um, the resulting distribution would, would be this. And you can see even with just two, even with just two distributions, neither of which 
is anywhere close to being a normal distribution. Their sum is already starting to look a little bit like the bell shape of a normal distribution. So this is a property you will see in every any model that has um, where you're modeling uncertainty and there's a, there's a summation as the primary operator. Um, similarly, uh, in models where you have products, um, so in event trees, we're often multiplying probabilities. Uh, you often see the products trending towards a log normal distribution. And again, in the limit, as the number of distributions gets really large, it will exactly become a log normal distribution at some point. Um, and again, the exact same two uniform distributions, and this time instead of adding them together, we're multiplying them, so drawing random samples from each um, distribution, multiplying them together, and the product here. Um, we'll see we'll we'll see about log normal distributions yesterday, but for now, if you're not familiar with them, you just have to trust me that this is already starting to look like the classic shape of a uh, of a log normal distribution. So that's good to know, and that's you know some of the some of the techniques out there um, take advantage of this. And um, there's also it's also related to some of the reasons why uh, you will often see lots of it's not it's fairly common for random variables. There's lots of random variables that have distributions that are normal or approximately normal, um, and it's in part because of the central limit theorem. So one of the reasons a lot of things in nature, um, like let's say height, right? Why, why, is, why is height normally distributed, right? If you were to take a, a large sample of people's height, um, you would get a, you know something that was pretty darn close to a normal distribution. Why is that? Well, in, in nature, um, uncertainty, let's say in height or whatever it is you're measuring, that's usually derived from the accumulation. And by accumulation, it ends up being a summation of lots of sources of uncertainty and lots of sources of small errors. Um, so when you accumulate those over, over a, a, a large number of um, items, right, you get this behavior of the central limit theorem where the uncertainty is going to start to look like a normal distribution. So that's kind of just useful to know that, you know, there is a there is an underlying reason why um, there's the normal distribution is pretty common and, and why there are many cases where data will uh, be a reasonable fit to either a normal or a large normal distribution. All right, next law of large numbers. I think I touched on this yesterday. This this really guides us as far as how and why Monte Carlo works. So a law of large numbers says that over many observations, many trials, many samples, either in the real world or in our model, um, the sample mean, which is what we estimate from our data or our model, will eventually converge towards the, the population mean and a way to think of the population mean is the true value, right? What the actual uh, correct value is. So you either need lots and lots of observations, or if you're doing it in a model where you're doing Monte Carlo, you need lots and lots of samples. And eventually, if you do enough samples, it will converge to the exact answer. Um, but it can be highly variable for small sample sizes. So this is just a trivial example of a coin toss simulated in a Monte Carlo. Um, where you're randomly generating coin tosses and counting up how many times you got heads, how many times you got tails, and calculating the probability of heads from that from that model frequency. So you can see here, even with a really trivial problem, right? You still need hundreds of um, hundreds of um, observations to to start to converge towards the what we know the correct value should be, right? Which is 0.5, assuming it's a fair coin. Um, but if, you know, even at you know, even at 100 samples, you can still deviate a lot from uh, 0.5. Um, so, in practice, in risk analysis, we often need you know thousands to tens of thousands, and sometimes millions of um, millions of Monte Carlo simulations um, to converge to the solution. Fortunately, with modern computers, that's not it's off. It's usually not a limitation. Um, in terms of having enough computer power to to run that many simulations. It's usually not a limiting factor for us these days. All right, Bayesian inference. So this is, um, we'll just give a, we're, we're going to walk through a little example on Bayesian inference. So this relates to how we do subjective probabilities. So it's 
the concepts are that it's kind of the, uh, known as the observational method. So we're basically um, observing all the different evidence and, and placing our judgment and weight on it. Um, it can also be used to um, think about the value of information. So how much um, is it worth going out and getting more information? You can use some um, Bayesian methods to evaluate those kinds of things. Um, the other thing, uh, at least the formal implementation of Bayesian inference does is it helps us minimize cognitive biases. So this comes into play when we're doing judgment and expert elicitation. It's really common and easy for our human minds to um, succumb to a whole host of different biases that could easily lead us to either overestimate or underestimate probabilities. Again, the human mind isn't well calibrated to estimate probabilities. It's not a natural thing for us. And so there's lots of things that can get in the way of us trying to estimate um, probabilities. So again, not necessarily using it formally, but um, at least thinking about it when you're doing expert elicitation in terms of how Bayes' theorem works can sometimes help uh, help manage some of these some of these things as they creep in. So this is what Bayes' theorem looks like. Uh, it has four terms to it. Um, the term um, I'll start with this term, this p of x uh, in the numerator on the right hand side. So this is an init, called an initial estimate or a prior. So this is your Kind of you think of it like your first guess at a probability. Uh, the second term in the numerator is you've gone out and collected some information or some evidence. And so this is an estimate of the probability of that you would have gotten that evidence um, given, given the event of interest. So the evidence is denoted as O here, and X is the event uh, that you're interested in estimating. Uh, the denominator is just a normalizing constant, so you look at all the different ways you could have obtained that evidence, and you get the total probability of that. Um, that's, again, just for normalizing purposes so that um, you get a correct um, probability out of uh, Bayes' theorem. And then the last term, which is the term on the left, which is the thing we're calculating, is what's the prob what's our, our new estimate, or updated estimate, um, given that we've accounted for whatever evidence we've observed. Um, so that's called a posterior um, probability estimate. We're going to go over just a really simple example just to see how, just so you can see how at least conceptually this, this can play out in terms of how probabilities going, work in Bayes' theorem. So this is a super simplified example, but it'll give you an idea to see how the terms work out. Um, so our task might be to estimate uh, whether or not our levy foundation has some sort of continuous permeable layer within it. We might make an initial estimate just based on um, the experts we have on the team, based on their current and past uh, experience, expertise, and judgment. We then say, OK, well, we want to go out and improve that estimate, so let's go out and collect some some data, some information. So maybe we go out and do an exploration program where we drill some holes to try to see if we can find uh, the layer that we're worried about. Uh, in this case, in this example, we're going to assume that uh, after we, uh, in doing our exploration program, we don't encounter any permeable materials that would suggest a permeable layer. Um, so that is our. Um, that is the, the outcome of our investigation. So the thing we need to know or thing we need to estimate is what's the probability that, that, that we would have had that result. So what's the probability that we would not have found a layer um, given, again, this vertical bar means given or conditional, right? So given that, that, that the, the layer exists, right? So our condition we're estimating is the probability that there is a permeable layer X. So we need to know, or we need to estimate what's the chance that we wouldn't have found it, assuming it's there. Um, just some made up numbers here just to show you how conceptually it plays out. So let's assume that we, we drilled borings at a spacing of 500 feet. Let's assume we think that if there is a permeable layer in the foundation, it's going to you know, be roughly 200 feet in, in extent. So we can then, you know, in this 
simplified example, we can actually explicitly estimate this probability um, for the evidence. So probability, so what's the probability that we would not have found uh, a permeable layer given that it's there um, based on our exploration program? So if we're drilling every 500 feet and the layer is only 200 feet in size, there's about a 60% chance that we're not going to hit it, right? Well, our borings are going to miss it. And, you know, with the numbers given here, you can calculate that explicitly. Oftentimes in practice, this would be another probability you'd probably have to estimate by judgment. But there's only a 40% chance we'll find it if it's there, and there's a 60% chance we're going to miss it. So that gives us this, this other term in Bayes' theorem. Moving on, uh, the normalizing constant. So again, um, we have to make sure that we normalize things so that we get a proper probability as the output of Bayes' theorem. So this is the total probability for the evidence. So given all the different ways things could have played out such that we didn't find a layer, uh, what's the total probability of that that, that um, could have happened? So there's two ways that in this, again, in this example, there's only two ways that can happen. Either the layer is there and we just missed it, we didn't find it, or the layer isn't there and we didn't find it. So um, the probability that it, that it exists comes from our prior probability estimate, which is 0.2. The probability that we didn't find it if it exists, or assuming it exists, comes from the previous slide based on our boring spacing, right? 60% chance if it's there, we, we're, we're still going to miss it. Um, so that's one outcome. And then the other outcome is it doesn't exist, so that's the complement of our estimate that it does, ex our initial estimate that it did, does exist. So 1 minus 0.2 is 0.8. And then if it's not there, um, there's no chance of finding it, right? No matter how many holes we drill, we can't find it if it doesn't exist. So that probability is 1. And again, we can use um, these are ands, so they're intersections, so we multiply these together. And then this is a um, a union operation, right? It's either it's either this one or this one is what could have happened. And so a union, and it's also mutually exclusive, right? It can't be both of these. It has to be one or the other. So when we have the union of mutually exclusive events, we can just sum their probabilities. So we, we do an addition here, and we get 0.92 for that number. So we plug those three, those three values that we've calculated into, into Bayes' theorem. And we get the, the value here in this last bullet. 0.2, our prior probability estimate. Uh, 0.6, our estimate of what's the chance that we um, what's the chance that we would that we um, given that we didn't find a layer, what's the chance that we wouldn't have found one um, if the layer was actually there? So that's the 0.6 from the previous slide, and then the normalizing constant, and we get 0.13. So despite doing a drilling program and looking for the layer, right, the probability didn't change dramatically. It went from 0.2 to 0.13. Um, and again, this is where you have to be aware, at least aware of. And, and again, you don't have to do this formally when you're doing risk analysis in terms of expert elicitation, but just be aware of, you know, the biases that can creep in. And, and the, the example here would be, you know, it might be, you might be quick to assume that, well, we drilled some holes and we didn't find anything. so. It, it's almost certainly not there, right? But if you look at it formally, what, what actually the most likely outcome is that you just missed it, right, for this particular example. So you didn't find it, you know, you, you didn't find it because it wasn't there. It's actually more likely that you didn't find it because if it was there, you just missed it, right? So again, at least conceptually understanding how, how these probabilities um, work together at least conceptually and based here, and can help you manage some of those um, some of those um, biases that can creep in in the expert elicitation. I'm going to go over the um, suggested answers for the knowledge check that you just completed, and then um, I'm going to do a quick little demonstration uh, in response to I think one of the questions that came in in the chat. All right, so knowledge check number two is this on probability theory and application. So this first question was one we covered um, during the lecture. So hopefully hopefully most folks got this one um, correct. Um, so this is uh, a question related to estimating long-term risk or long-term probabilities. 
uh, so probabilities over time. And again, the classic question, if you purchase a home in a 100-year floodplain, what's the chance that your house will experience flood damage over the course of a 30-year mortgage? And if we want to be more precise with this question, we could say experience flood damage at least once, right? So you can see some different options to choose from here, and the correct option here is um, De Morgan's Law along with the rule of subtraction to get that um, estimate. So again, we can take um, 1 minus the probability of flooding, which is 1 in 100 per year. Um, that gives us the probability of not being flooded in a given year. Um, and the only way that we can go through a full 30 years without with never experiencing any flood damage is if we have no flooding every year for 30 years, right? So 1 minus 1 over 100 is the probability that we didn't experience flooding in a given year. Um, we need that to happen every year for 30 years, so we raise that to the 30th power, right? So again, this is another example of, uh, remember that the power operation is just multiplying that number by itself 30 times, right? So this is also an application of intersection, right? So we need no flooding each year for 30 years. So we need that full sequence to happen in order to never be flooded. Um, so it's essentially 1 minus 1 over 100, 0.99 times 0.99 times 0.99, 30 times, right? Um, so that gives us the total probability that we never get flooded in 30 years. So the complement of never being flooded in 30 years means we've experience flood damage at some point one or more times in that 30 years. So we can calculate the complement of that or one minus that number. And again, that gives us uh, 0.26. And you can see here the, the big range of estimates you can get. Um, so just to highlight the idea that, you know, kind of understanding um, which calculation and which rule applies based on um, what types of events you have and how they relate to one another can have a big effect on your both your probability estimates and your risk calculations. So um, it's good to have all these concepts kind of sorted out and make sure you're um, using the right rule for the right types of events. Uh, second question, which of the following is a type of probability? So these are all uh, commonly used words to describe the two types of probability. So first type is a typically a frequentist probability, but it can also be called a physical probability. And then the other type of probability is subjective, but degree of belief is another commonly used term to describe that second type of probability. So any of these four would be uh, uh, a description of one of the two types of probability. So remember, there's generally two types, but there's multiple phrases that are commonly used to describe the two types. Um, question number three, which of the following options is the, is the best example for two Statistically dependent events, or remember statistically dependent events means the probability of one event um, depends on what happened uh, or the occurrence of, a, of another event. So the first one is probability of a permeable layer um, irrespective of the magnitude of the flood loading. So that indicates, that phrasing indicates that the probability of this layer um, doesn't care what the flood loading was and it's not dependent on the flood loading. So those would be, that'd be an example of independent events, so that wouldn't apply. Um, second one is conditional. So often with dependent events, you'll see conditional probabilities. So that's a key, key giveaway there. Conditional probability estimates for dune erosion are as follows. So in that table, it's the probability of dune erosion, and it depends on um, how big the hurricane was, right, what the hurricane category was. So that would be the best example of events that are um, dependent. The chance of the dune eroding depends on what kind of hurricane we get. Uh, and then the third one, marginal. Again, key word here, marginal. Marginal annual fair probability has some estimate to it, right? If it's marginal, then um, that estimate is irrespective of the other events, so we're not talking about dependency there. And then the last one, the joint probability. Um, is negligible for this risk assessment. So again, this is this is a real thing, right? It's something that might be part of our um, thought process when we're building a risk model, but it's not 
related to whether the events are independent or not. Um, we're simply making a statement that the chance of two, two of them occurring is so small. They could be dependent, they could be independent. Uh, and we're just saying that if their joint probability is really small, we're going to leave it out of our risk model. So that's not really an example of dependence or independence. All right, question four, if the probability of getting a, a warning is 0.8 and the probability of safely evacuating given that the warning was received, key clue here, given, conditional, um, what's the chance that you will safely evacuate? So to safely evacuate, both things have to happen, right? You have to both receive a warning and you have to safely evacuate after you receive the warning. So that's an intersection event. Remember, both, both think of and. Um, so we're going to want to use the rule that applies to intersection events, and that's the rule multiplication. So we can take the probability of getting the warning times the probability of evacuating, given that we've received the warning, to get that estimate. And again, you'll see the, the wide variety of estimates depending on whether or not you pick the appropriate uh, calculation for the situation. And then the last question, if the probability of failure for internal erosion is 0.02 and the probability of failure for overtopping breach is 0.04, what's the total probability of failure assuming these two failure modes are mutually exclusive? So uh, total probability of failure, uh, we're talking about union here, right? So that means either, either event could occur, so it's an or condition. Um, the dam could fail or the levee, whatever this is, could fail either by internal erosion or overtopping erosion um, or possibly both. So we want to use the, the rule for union, which is the rule of addition. And in this particular example, since for whatever reason we're assuming these ferry modes are mutually exclusive, um, we can simply add their probabilities and um, we're assuming that this intersection PA times PB is equal to zero, right? So it'd just be the sum of the two individual um, probability estimates. Any comments, questions, concerns about the knowledge check? There was a, a comment in the chat about binomial versus Poisson. Um, so the way I'll try to explain this pretty simply is um, you can model these types of things two different ways. You can either model them um, as a discrete process or as a continu continuous process. And there's different formulas and probability distributions that support both of those options. So typically in risk analysis and in flood hydrology and in dam and levee safety, we model um, we model things as, as a, what's called block uh, block maxima. So what that means is we take, um, for example, time, and we divide it into discrete blocks of the same size, usually annual, right? And we only look at the maximum event um, that happens in each block, right? So block annual maxima is the term that they use for that. Um, so that is the discrete version where we're only considering blocks of one year in size and we're only looking at the maximum event that happens in each block. So that is the calculation that was in the exercise for the question about the 100-year floodplain. And here in the spreadsheet, I, I did some an example real quick here. So here's, here's the formula here, you know, the 1 minus 1 minus 0 0.01 to the 30th power, right? That comes from that that kind of modeling framework. Um, the, the other way to calculate it longhand is with the binomial distribution, right, which is shown in these columns here. So this is where you get into all the combinations, right? So you have you can have 31 different outcomes represented by the values in this column E here. And this column E is the number of floods that you would experience over a 30 year period, right? So you can get zero, one, two, three, all the way up to 30. The second column is the binomial coefficient that we talked about yesterday. So this is all the different ways, all the different combinations uh, in which you could have that number of floods over a 30 year period, right? So you can see that there's only one way you can have zero floods, right? It's, it's every year has zero floods. 
Um, there's 30 ways you could have one flood because it could happen in any any given year from year one through year 30. And then you can see as you go down through this list, this is where I talked about the number of combinations gets to be an astronomically large number. Um, so that's that's the number of combinations for each of those possible number of floods. And then each of those combinations has a probability associated with it. So what's the what's the probability of getting um, let's say one flood event, right? Um, so the probability of getting one flood event means you had uh, one flood event and 29 years where you didn't have a flood event. So it'd be 0 0.01 to the first power um, times 0.99 probability of not getting a flood to the 29th power. And I have it worked out here in a formula, so it does it automatically through all these values. Um, same thing here for the second one, right? It's 0 0.01 to the second power because you have two two flood events and uh, all re all remaining years you don't have a flood event, so it'd be, 20, it'd be 0 0.99 to the 28th power. And you can you can do all those calculations. And then essentially the total probability, which comes from the binomial distribution, is the number of combinations times the probability of each combination. Right? So you just multiply columns F and G together, and you get the, these values in column H. So you can do that for all the all the all the different outcomes of zero through thirty floods. Okay, and then you can answer the the same question, right? What's the probability that I don't see a flood in thirty years? Well, the only outcome that zero floods is this first this first um, element here in H, right, 0.7397. And then you say, okay, well, if I don't get a flood, the other outcome is I, I had a flood, right? So what's the probability that I had a flood? And again, it's technically one or more. Um, well, that is, it could happen any of these ways, right? These are all the different ways it could happen. So I can sum all those up and get that probability. And you'll notice here, if you do it this long way, you get the exact same number that you get over here doing it the shortcut way. So that kind of just shows you the how the shortcut works and, and that kind of a proof that it works with a with a tangible example. Okay, so the, the other way the other way you can look at these types of models is as continuous models. So you could say that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna subdivide the year into blocks, you know, or annual blocks, and I'm not gonna only look at the annual maximum. I'm gonna look at the possibility that, you know, any number of floods could happen in any any given year, right? It's a continuous Continuous process. Um, so that comes from the essentially from the that calculation can come from the Poisson distribution. So um, it's conceptually the same calculation. You still have these common, you know, these outcomes of zero through 30 floods uh, being possible outcomes over a 30-year period. But the formula looks a little bit different. Um, you get um, in this case, it's it's the rate at which floods occur. Uh, which is 0.01 per year times the number times the time the duration 30 years raised to a power that's equal to um, the number of floods you're estimating for, which in this first row is zero, and then you end up with a, the exponential function in here. So then it's times e to the again the rate times the times the time, so 0.01 times 30 years divided by um, the factorial of the number of events you're looking at. So that's essentially the Poisson distribution. And again, you can copy that formula down and do those calculations. Now, if you, if you compare these columns, right, they're, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close, right? And the reason they're, they're pretty close is that um, the chance of a 100-year flood is small enough, and the odds of getting more than one 100-year flood in a given year is small enough that the, the discrete model is a excellent approximation, right? Um, so that's kind of why why it works out. You know, even though if you believe floods are a continuous process, um, because the odds of say getting 200 year floods in a in the same year are pretty small, we can get away with doing this block annual maximum approach where we only look at one single annual maximum flood. Um, there's other reasons why we do that for planning purposes and consequences and damages and all kinds of other things that I won't go into. But from a statistical standpoint, um, that's kind of why, you know, when you're de dealing with um, relatively infrequent events, I'd say things that are less than 1 in 10 return period, 
um, the difference makes no difference in practice, right? Um, so if you if you run that through here, you can do the exact same calculation where you sum up all the instances where you had a flood and all the and the single instance where you didn't, and you get a probability of getting flooded of 0.259, which is basically the same answer we got using the discrete version. Um, the other way you can calculate it directly is you can calculate it directly from the exponential distribution version of the calculation we did with De Morgan's, um, De Morgan's law. So that's two different ways you can do it. And, and oftentimes, you know, you might see variations depending different disciplines or different fields of practice might use, um, might use different, um, might choose one or the other for, for various reasons. Um, but in most of the time in flood hydrology, we're using the discrete one. Um, times to use the continuous one is either when the rate is when you're interested in things that happen relatively frequently, so let's say more frequently than about one in 10. Roughly one in 10 is where the two methods start to converge to the same answer. So, um, you know, if you're interested in things that are relatively frequent, then the continuous option is probably a better choice. Or if you're also, if you're interested in things that are, um, that don't happen every year, right? So like, again, I, I use a lot of flood hydrology examples because that's my main background, but if, um, you know, in flood hydrology, we're generally assuming there's some maximum flood every year. But let's say if you're if you're interested in modeling um, hurricanes that make landfall in you know on the east coast of Florida, right? That doesn't happen every year. Um, so in that case, um, you know, using a continuous um, the continuous version of this model with a rate where you know maybe you get one hurricane that makes landfall every five years or, you know, whatever the number might be, um, might be a better choice in terms of modeling risk. Um, another comment that came in the chat that um, was about things like that can be progressive. So um, that certainly can be, can be done. Um, there are ways, and we're not going to cover them in this class, but there are, uh, there are tools and techniques and models where you can model um, Things that happen over time, um, you know, time-dependent reliability analysis. So you could have, you know, maybe it takes four floods for erosion to become a problem enough that you know it might lead to failure. Or, or things like um, things that age and degrade over time are often modeled that way, and and we can do models to to estimate, you know, when's the best time to go in and either repair or replace a component. So those those are all available and can handle those kinds of situations. Typically, again, speaking for the core, um, core of engineers in dam and levee safety, we typically uh, don't uh, model dam and levee safety risk that way, but it certainly um, is an option and certainly can be done that way. So I, hopefully that gives you a little bit more feel for how some of these, um, some of these calculations um, work out. Oh, well, one more question in the chat. So Poisson used with partial duration. Yeah, so if you're doing, um, and again, this is maybe somewhat of a flood hydrology thing. If you're doing a partial duration analysis, you would um, typically use the um, continuous, um, kind of the, you know, what I'll loosely call the continuous formulation of things. Um, because you're in partial duration, you're basically setting a threshold and you're counting all events that are greater than the threshold, and oftentimes you will get multiple events um, that exceed the threshold in, the, in a given year. So you, you want to look at it from the viewpoint of a continuous um, formulation of the model. 